All right, we can get started for the last lecture of the day. So now we're going back to Andrea's lectures about uh, asymptotic symmetries. Take it away. Yeah, thank you. So welcome back to Asymptotic Symmetries 3. Let me remind you what we ended on learning in the lecture yesterday in the afternoon. So after the morning session where we sort of defined what we mean by an asymptotic flat space time, um, using the bondi sachs formalism, we then went on to determine the asymptotic symmetries in quite some detail. Um, and we contrasted the symmetries which are asymmetries, which, have, um, uh, which are given by some diffeomorphism vector field that satisfies the Killing equation exactly. Um, we put this in contrast with what we call asymptotic symmetries, um, whose, where the lead derivative of the metric, or in general some other fields, which we will talk about uh, later in this lecture, um, where the lead derivative of the metric with respect to that diffeomorphism vector field, uh, it vanishes only asymptotically as we go out uh, to R goes to infinity. And we then ask, well, what are all the residual gauge transformations or diffeomorphisms that we can do on the metric uh, in order to determine this, uh, this asymptotic symmetries? And the formalism that we followed was pick a gauge. This was where we spent some time on using you know, uh, constant U hypersurfaces, null hypersurfaces, and we sort of derived what kind of metric components are zero. This was our gauge conditions. And then um, we had to impose certain fall-offs on the free, uh, a priori free uh, metric functions. And uh, BMS told us how to do that. Or, well, they made a proposal for, for uh, what boundary conditions to impose. Um, and let me highlight here again that the sort of the story of asymptotic symmetries and the finding of boundary conditions is sometimes more of, a, of an art because you have to find boundary conditions that are strong enough so that you avoid pathologies, but they also should be weak enough so that you capture interesting uh, space times or interesting uh, configurations in general. And then we went on and uh, looked at all the possible diffeomorphisms um, that leave the gauge conditions exactly invariant and that preserve the boundary conditions in the sense that they preserve the one over R uh, falloffs, um, leaving uh, arbitrary functions or a priori arbitrary functions of the null coordinate um, at the boundary uh, as well as the angles. And then we saw that the Einstein equations, they constrain the evolution of certain components uh, in the metric. Um, and there were some extra conditions like the um, symmetric and trace freeness of the angular part of the metric, which then further uh, gave us further constraints. And what we then found was that you find diffeomorphism vector fields xi um, that contain the translations, but they are actually enhanced infinitely to super translations, which come with some parameter uh, that are called f, which is a priori an arbitrary function of the angles. And once we restrict that function to the ILMs with L0 or 1, uh, or in these stereographic coordinates, um, are sort of proportional or given by no monomials in one z, z bar, z, z bar, and then we uh, go back to translations. We then ask um, whether, the, and the point was here that with the boundary conditions that uh, Metzner, Van der Burg, and Sachs uh, gave us, there's no way around this super here. We can't just have translations, we have in general super translations. And that infinitely enhanced the Poincare group um, from uh, just Lorentz and translations to Lorentz times super translations. And th we then went on to ask, can Lorentz transformations also be enhanced? And we found the diffeomorphism vector field. Well, we didn't derive it, but I gave it to you. Um, and there we found uh, these so-called super rotations, which enhance uh, the Lorentz transformations. And we found there sort of two somewhat qualitatively different cases. One where we have a vector field that is holomorphic up to singular points which uh, violated the boundary conditions at isolated points. Um, and this was sort of related to some, some Virasoro symmetry. And we motivated this by saying that in 2D CFD, we also allow uh, holomorphic symmetry parameters um, that have singularities. 
and we will later on uh, get back to this point and motivate it a bit more. And then we also saw that um, people proposed an extension um, or sort of a more, let's say, general vector field that also um, allowed for some arbitrary dependence on the empty holomorphic coordinate. And so this gives two different or a priori distinct um, proposals for an extension of the um, symmetric group of Einstein gravity um, in asymptotically flat space times. And we recover again uh, just the Lorentz transformations by restricting this vector field to be a global conformal Killing vector field, um, which roughly speaking um, just depends on these monomials 1, z, and z squared. And they are complex conjugates. Okay, so we now found this infinite well, twice infinite dimensional symmetry group. And now the question is, well, what does it physically mean? And now I cheated a little bit. Um, because of the enthusiasm yesterday at the end of the lecture for doing needy greedy calculations. So um, I've already written here the way we're focusing now on super translations. So this was this vector field, which at the null boundary, just corresponded, let me write this again, just corresponded to translations in U, but not just constant translations, those would be just the usual time translations. So if F was one, this would be uh, translations in the retarded time. But now we have this arbitrary function F here, and these are super translations on a boundary. And then there are subleading terms, D by dr, and one over R, D by dA. And now the question is, how do, what do super translations actually do? So you can now go and compute the, the lead derivative of the metric with respect to this vector field here. And then you look, so our metric had different components. Um, the UU component contained the bond mass aspect. The UA component at subleading order uh, contained the angular momentum aspect. And the AB component, so the angular piece, uh, contained, well, at the leading order, just uh, the metric on the two sphere the usual round metric on a two sphere, but then at subleading order, so that was multiplied by R square, and then at subleading order multiplied by R, we had this um, uh, function that we call the gravitational data or shear. So those are the, these three things that arise. And starting from this gravitational data, we then defined another tensor that we called NAB, which is just the U derivative of CAB, and whose square uh, is related to the energy flux. And now you can ask, well, how do super translations act? So you just compute the lead derivative. Um, you look at the different one over R pieces in the metric, and then you read off how these pieces in the metric transform. So this is what I've written here. So in particular, here we see that the um, gravitational data uh, has a homogeneous term and then some inhomogeneous piece. And the variation of the, of the news just follows by taking a U derivative, very simple. And then we also have the, the way that the bonding mass aspect and the angular momentum aspect changes under a super translation. And now let's see what that actually physically means. So what do super translations mean physically? And we will start, we will look at the very simplest uh, example. We will take Minkowski space, which means that all these nice uh, functions are actually zero. So M and A and C and B vanish. And now let's see what the super translated Minkowski space is. So we want to compute the new M and A and C A B. Well, let's look over here. So M, N, A, and C A B are zero. So there's not much that is left. So this guy goes away, and we're only left with this. This guy goes away. This, this, this goes away. And this, this, everything goes away. So the change of the bondy mass aspect vanishes, and the change of the angular momentum aspect also vanishes. Uh, yeah. And um, 
and the change of the new tensor also vanishes. And that's actually a good thing because diffeomorphisms cannot you know, generate gravitational waves, they cannot uh, generate energy. So that's what we expect. But if we look at the change of CAB, there is an inhomogeneous piece. So there is what we call this a shift term, which is given by what I've written over there, minus 2 the A dBf plus gamma AB d square F. And I remind you again that the A is the covariant derivative on the two sphere. D square is the Laplace on the two sphere. And this is not zero. Because when we do a super translation, we pick some f. f is not zero. And f is not a constant. Um, if f was a constant, for example, if we do a global time translation, so f would be 1, then this would also go away, which is what we would expect. So now we see that the new CAB is no longer zero after doing a super translation, except if the super translations are restricted to uh, global translations. OK, interesting. So now I'm in Minkowski space. What do we have? We have vanishing curvature. So it turns out that CAB, for vanishing curvature, CAB doesn't have to vanish, but it has to, it is restricted. And it's restricted to take the following form. There's some derivative, derivatives that hit some function C, which is now sort of a, like a spin zero piece uh, of this uh, gravitational data plus gamma AB d square C. <coughs> where we call C the Goldstone boson of spontaneously broken for translation symmetry. And if you compare this form of CAB with this form over here, you will find that the variation of this C, the Goldstone boson, is just given by F. So if you just compare. And if you have different values of C, they label for you different gravitational vacua. So I looked at the very simplest case, Minkowski, and we saw that if we do a super translation, then not everything remains trivial. We, have, uh, we turn on um, this gravitational data here. And um, because we have still vanishing curvature, this gravitational data is constrained. And it is constrained by something that now labels different vacuum. One can think of this as you start with Minkowski space, you do a super translation, you go to a different vacuum because you didn't change the energy, so it's degenerate. And so the value of C labels for you different uh, degenerate vacuum. Now, you could start with some other space time and then do a super translation and look at what that does. For example, it has been looked at uh, Schwarzschild black holes, um, which have, uh, well, where M would then cor correspond to the mass. The angular momentum aspect would vanish for Schwarzschild. This would vanish too. And then when you super translate Schwarzschild, you would go from um, what you might call a bold black hole to a black hole with hair. And then you can look at other, uh, at other space terms of interest and see what super translations do. Now, I've been asked yesterday um, several times about how one should think about um, these asymptotic symmetries even more physically. Uh, is there something that we can detect or observe? I did not plan to talk about this because five hours are too short to cover all the infrared aspects of gravity. But because of the questions, let me just briefly um, sketch this. 
um, sketch uh, an observational consequence of these asymptotic symmetries. So at the end of last lecture, I drew, I drew this triangle here, where I put on one corner asymptotic symmetries. And I said that asymptotic symmetries are intricately related to um, what's called the memory effect. Um, what the memory effect is can be understood as the action of an asymptotic symmetry transformation. So now I have to define what the memory effect is. So let me just sketch this. So we're drawing again our Penrose diagram. Um, let me some color. Um, these circles here denote the two sphere. And now let's imagine that we have, um, so this is something that uh, gravitational wave experiments uh, would like to detect, the memory effect. So what happens there, you have some detectors, maybe you arrange them to, um, so in some spherical array, you have some de detectors that are uh, co-moving, and a gravitational wave passes and it jiggles the detectors, and then once the wave has passed, they settle down again in some equilibrium configuration. And you might expect that the equilibrium configuration is the same as before. But that's not true. At least it's not true if the, if the memory effect uh, is uh, a real effect uh, in nature, and we believe it is. And so measuring it would be uh, a nice confirmation of some aspect of general relativity. And so what, what do we have to measure? So imagine some detectors that are separated in angular distance um, by some distance s. And then the detectors. Uh, sort of move in time, and then a gravitational wave passes. From some time u early to some time u late. And what the gravitational wave will do is, it will lead to some, my artistic capabilities are, okay, here we go. So you will go from some angular separation s to some angular separation s plus delta s caused by the gravitational wave. And I will not derive this, but you can show that this delta s, let me now put an index. This can be the z or the z bar index here. Comes with the metric gamma ab. You can compute using the geodesic deviation equation and then, you know, plugging in curvatures and so on. Um, you can show that this is given by something that goes like 1 over r times the change in CAB, SB. And this here, this piece here, is precisely what we just computed over there. Um, in the case of Minkowski space, but you can do this in general. You can start with some uh, space time that has some CAB, you do a uh, super translation, you go to a space time with some different CAB, there will be a difference. It turns out that the memory effect, where you have this geodesic deviation equation for detectors, um, is precisely proportional to this delta CAB. So you can interpret the memory effect as um, the vacuum transition from one of these gravitational vacua with one label C to another gravitational vacuum with another label C. Yes. Sorry, say it again. So here I, I took uh, the cosmological, cosmological constant to be zero. Yeah, so, yeah, but you can stay at distances that are much smaller than the cosmological scale. So, I mean, the LIGO, LIGO will never be at infinity, right? Like, at, uh, yes, so I mean, it, okay, the, the distance of the, well, the size of the measurement device is also geared towards what kind of um, gravitational wave, uh, you know, make measurements they can do, like what kind of systems, what kind of black hole mergers or whatnot. So that's constrained by this. Um, talking to um, people that think about the measurability of gravitational memory effects, um, like Grant and Nichols, they tell me that they think that the, the, this gravitational memory effect um, will be measurable with LIGO in the next couple of years. 
There exists other memory effects, um, which I'll maybe mention um, later on, which is more subleading than this one. It's called the, so this is called the gravitational displacement memory effect for obvious reasons. There's also something called the gravitational spin memory effect, and which is much harder to measure because it's, it's more subleading. But they also hope that with some sophisticated uh, methods and data analysis, including stacking of events, that they will also be able to measure that, but that's on a much larger time scale. So there is LIGO, LISA, Cosmic Explorer, Einstein Telescope, all of these experiments, um, and Kagra, and you know, all of these experiments are hoping to measure the gravitational memory effect on, well, different timescales because some of the experiments haven't been built yet. Um, but that's something that should be, let's say, in the next decade, <laughs> hopefully. So that will be very nice. Yes? Is that the time delay? No, so here, uh, there, there is a time delay involved in the spin memory effect. Um, the way you could measure that is in a Sagnac interferometer, where you look at the counter-orbiting uh, yeah, counter uh, beams, um, and it's um, that's sort of a, you integrate over time. The, this would take me much longer to, to discuss, but uh, I can give you references for that. Yeah, so here this really just comes from the geodesic deviation equation. Okay, so uh, hopefully I have convinced you um, that asymptotic symmetries relate to something rather physical um, that should be measurable within the next couple of years. There's another infrared effect um, that's um, very important for various reasons that Cliff talked about before, which is soft theorems. Um, I think I mentioned yesterday that soft theorems and memory facts are exactly the same thing upon a Fourier transform. So you learn from Cliff what the soft theorem is. I sketched what the memory fact is, so you can do the Fourier transform. And see that actually the original um, soft theorem that Weinberg studied for particles and the memory fact that uh, uh, Polnareff, Zeldovich, uh, and so on studied for macroscopic objects like... Uh, neutron stars or black holes, the two effects here are exactly the same um, related by a Fourier transform. Um, if I had more time, I would go through this in detail, but I don't. And the main task that I've been given was to talk about symmetries. So what I will do in the rest of the lecture is talk about the relation between asymptotic symmetries and soft theorems, and then recast them in a little bit of a different language that will allow us to exploit uh, the powerful techniques of CFD in order to shine yet another different light on what uh, asymptotic symmetries are. Um, on that note, um, Cliff already mentioned that there are some conservation laws um, associated to soft theorems. Well, I've told you here that there is some action of super translation on um, the gravitational data and, well, the radiative data at the, at the null boundary. They will also give rise to conservation equations. Okay, so let me say, I've told you some physical manifestation of asymptotic symmetries is memory. Now another physical manifestation is that there are uh, conservation laws for the charges that are associated to the super translations, which I will write down in a moment. And then there's a third um, sort of physical manifestation or implication of asymptotic symmetries, which arises in the context of thinking about infrared divergences. So in four dimensions, we have infrared divergences. If you exponentiate them, you get zero. Um, it has been um, argued or shown that the, the vanishing of these uh, amplitudes because of infrared divergences comes from the non-conservation of these asymptotic symmetry charges. So this is maybe not a, a, an observational uh, aspect of asymptotic symmetries, but it's an explanation um, for why uh, amplitudes with infrared divergences exponentiate and give zero uh, in terms of uh, the violation of some conservation laws. Okay. Are there any questions on this or complaints? Okay. If not, then we're going to talk about charges. And if I had time, I would go through the whole shebang 
which goes under the name of covariant phase space formalism. But since I don't, I won't. And I will just write down for you the charges that are associated to super translations and super rotations. So let's start with the super translations. And let me draw here again our beloved Penrose diagram, where we have scry plus and scry minus. And they will also introduce, give a name to the boundary regions of the boundary. So there's the past boundary as, so we have u, which goes in that direction, and we have uh, u equals minus infinity over here. And I will refer to this region as scry plus minus. So it's the past boundary of future null infinity. And similarly, u goes to plus infinity over here. And we'll refer to this region as scry plus plus. And then the same thing at the pass boundary, but now with uh, the coordinate v, which increases in this direction. So that's the future of the, sorry, that's the future, yeah, the future of the pass boundary. And this here is the past of the pass boundary. And we're going to now look at charges that are defined here and here. So the future and the pass boundary. So the ones on the future boundary are denoted by a plus, and we're looking at super translations with some function f. And these are given by 1 of over 4 pi g. Then there's an integral over the 2 sphere at scry plus minus. So at u goes to minus infinity, d square x. Then we have the induced metric square root gamma, f of x, and m of u x. It's xa, but I'm, I'm a bit lazy. I'll, I'll drop some indices from now on. And then similarly, we have the past boundary. Or I have a minus here. I have a minus plus here. And there is a v in here. And then we have super rotations. with respect to this vector field, y, which is given by 1 over 8 pi g. Same story, so scry plus minus, d square x, square root gamma. And now this has to do with the angular momentum aspect, which has an index. And it gets contracted with this vector field. And you may notice that sometimes I use x or xa for the boundary, and sometimes z bar. That's, uh, I mean, it's the same. And uh, then also for the past boundary, we have the chart as cry minus plus, and we have V here. And if these were charges that are conserved, they better be conserved from the past to the future. So we have some classical con uh, conservation law. that says that q plus equals q minus. Um, which is almost fine, except that we have a mass that depends on u and x and, and na uh, of u and x, or v and x. And so actually, in order for this classical conservation law to hold, there has to be some relation between m at the future and at the past boundary, as well as n and also these uh, the symmetry parameters, f and ya. And so there has to be some sort of matching in any, um, pro in any scattering process where something comes in from the past boundary and goes out to the future boundary. These two need to be linked in some way. And the way that the fields are linked um, is via an antipodal matching condition. which is one that preserves CPT symmetry. And what is it? It says that, um, let's start with m. So m of x on the, future, on the past of the future boundary, so here, 
is identified with m of x at the future of the past boundary here. The same goes for Na, and the same goes also for the symmetry parameters. So with these matching conditions, we have a conservation law. And one of the purposes of today's lecture will be to investigate this conservation law, which is here a classical conserva uh, conservation law, at the quantum level um, when we think about the S-matrix. So now we're really starting the topic of lecture three, which is soft symmetries of the S-matrix. So uh, Cliff already explained um, what, soft, what soft theorems are. And I could now just skip what I planned to do, since you now all know what soft theorems are. But I decided not to. Instead, I will apply Fermi's rule, which is that, uh, so he said, never underestimate the joy people derive from hearing things they already know. So let me go again through the statement of soft theorems. Now directly for the case of gravity, um, and we will go a little bit further, and then also I want to use this to set up, um, sort of uh, set up what I want to get to at the end of the lecture, um, which is a way to view soft theorems from the point of view of some putative conformal field theory. Okay, so we're going to jump to uh, an n-particle um, amplitude, which I'll also denote in these lectures by this. We have momenta pi running from 1 to n. We may also have um, spins running from 1 to n. And what Cliff explained was that if you have such an amplitude, with n particles where, where's my color? Ah. Where you can attach um, a particle whose um, energy and momentum go to zero. There are various different ways how we can do that. So we can attach it to an incoming leg, to an outgoing leg or an internal lag. And I'm spared to explain why this one is subleading, because Cliff already did that. So that's great. So we have um, processes where um, an energetically soft particle, um, in this case we'll focus on gravitons, is attached to an incoming or an outgoing lag. Um, to confuse you, um, I will use different notation. Um, so I think the p's are the same. The k's are also the same, but I will also denote them by pulling out some scale, the energy, times q mu. So this is not the same q mu as you saw before. And this is, so this is just the null vector, uh, and this is the scale, the energy. And then we have the following statement, that this n plus 1 particle amplitude in the limit as omega goes to zero, goes to some factor, which I denote by S zero, times the amplitude without this soft particle. And then what we're doing here is an expansion at low energies. So in principle, there are dot, dot, dots here. And Cliff explained that this leading process here, um, which comes with, with, which starts with a pole in one over the energy, the Weinberg soft pole. This is a weekly line. Um, this is universal. And in general, dot, dot, dots here um, depend on the specifics of the theory. Okay, so this is Weinberg and many others that contributed to the understanding of, um, of soft theorem uh, over the years, um, leading up to this here. So this is a universal factorization process. 
Um, yeah. And so you only need to know what massless particle you attach will attach a graviton. And you need to know the extra vertex and the propagator um, that's uh, associated to the hard particle we will use scalars as well, um, to which this soft particle is attached. And now, let me rederive again this factor S0 in a bit more pedestrian way, I guess. So we want to look at soft gravitons and hard scalars. Um, we have the gravitational interaction given by kappa over 2, h mu nu. So that's the expansion of the metric in terms of eta mu nu plus h mu nu um, times dotted into the stress tensor, where this kappa here is square root oops, 32 pi g. And uh, you just learned that it has to be uh, the same kappa for everybody by the equivalence principle. Um, so now if we have the, the scalar field as a stress tensor, T mu nu, given by D mu phi, D nu phi, minus one half, eta mu nu, D rho phi, D rho phi. And we're going to stick in plane waves. So phi is just e to the ip dot x. And the gravitons, so h mu nu, has some polarization tensor, which was called e before. I'm calling it epsilon. e to the ik dot x. And we have that epsilon mu nu dotted into k mu is 0. And also that epsilon mu nu, eta mu nu, is 0. And now we just have to look at the vertex and the propagator. So we do a little side calculation. Well, you can do it yourself. Um, as an exercise, you just plug in the phi's and the h's in here and look at the interaction term that I have covered here. So there will be an epsilon coming from H, and there will be factors of the P's coming from T mu nu. So the vertex will then look like um, I cup over 2, epsilon mu nu, 2 P mu, P nu. And then the propagator. And we can assume that our scalars are massive. Oh, probably you can't see. OK, this is going to be interesting. OK, so p plus k squared plus m squared, which let me do this very in a very pedestrian way, k squared plus 2 p dot k plus k squared plus m square, and now you just learned that if you put um, the external lines on shell, um, you have the, oops, you have p square um, equals minus m square, so that goes away. Uh, k square uh, is again subleading as we take k to zero, so the thing that remains is precisely this combination of um, p dotted into k. And then the inter internal lines, they never go on shell. And so there will never be a pole as k goes to 0. And so that's why there's a bleeding. Um, and now we're going to sum. So here, I've, uh, say I've chosen to attach a soft particle to the outgoing leg. If I attach it to the ingoing leg, this will come with a minus sign. And then if I add them all up, I will get this soft factor. S0 that you have already seen before. So S0 is the sum of all the in and outgoing um, particles where you attach the soft particle to, 
comes with an eta i, which is plus or minus one, depending on whether you have in or out, or incoming or outgoing fields. There's a kappa over two. There's a pi mu, um, a pi nu, epsilon mu nu, and this pole as k goes to zero. And from the way that I've written down this polarization tensor, this is, this is defined only up to shifts that uh, you heard about before. And if you plug in um, the shift of epsilon um, by something that's proportional to um, the vector k, then you will get a shift of this soft factor, which shift by shifting uh, epsilon will give you something that's proportional to the sum over the momenta, which is zero by energy momentum conservation. Now, and so this followed from the gauge invariance of the soft factor. And now let me get back to the statement about the dot 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 terms here. So let me also now put the plus or minus here. Um, so this is either a positive or negative helicity uh, polarization tensor. And let me write it in a slightly different form. So let me pull out the pole in the energy and let me call the rest of this factor S, S hat. It turns out that there is a subleading piece here that goes like omega to the zero, which is also universal. There's a plus minus for whether the soft graviton has positive or negative felicity. And then there are um, terms that go with positive powers in the energy. And let me also call this somewhat differently. So in terms of what I've written before, this guy was just uh, the S matrix element wedged between the in and out states, which are given by these uh, scalars with momentum, momenta P, Pi. And here, this is given by we can either uh, create a soft graviton in the in state or annihilate it in the out state. So here we have um, the annihilation operator with positive or negative helicity, which depends on the energy. And I'm only writing this one because the, the one with the creation operator where you have S a dagger, this gives you essentially the same matrix element by CPT symmetry. So this is this, and it's related to this S matrix element without that soft particle. And well, let me just write it out um, because we'll use it later on. So from now on, I will strip off the energies and put them outside. And I will just be using these factors that only depend on the, the hard energies, so to say. It's just rewriting what I've written above by putting in the um, polarizations, and now um, we have this pole here at, uh, we have no longer the pole here because the pole in P dot K came from K going to zero, but I've pulled out uh, the omega here. Omega goes to zero, so here we just have something that's, that's finite. And then, so this is Weinberg and people leading up to that. And then the subleading piece was actually, and this was in the 60s, and the subleading piece was actually only um, understood in 2014 by Kachasus Rominger using modern amplitude techniques, so including the ones that uh, you've learned about uh, in the previous lecture. And so this is more difficult to, to derive. Let me just give you the result. So this is P I mu. But now, um, OK, let me, let me make you guess. So here, the gauge invariance of the soft factor, this leading soft graviton factor, um, led to the statement of energy momentum conservation. Would you expect there to be another universal soft theorem? Yes, no? Who is for yes? Well, okay, I've written it here, but why? <laughs> angular momentum, yeah, good. So instead of having the second P here, there will now be an angular momentum. And we have some power of this, uh, the, the null vector for the, the soft graviton that gets dotted into it. Epsilon. And pi dot q. Okay. So 
these are the two universal soft factors that only depend on the momenta and the angular momenta of the hard particles, but nothing else. And if you run the same game with shifting the epsilon tensor here, the, the polarization tensor, you will find what you will find. If you do the shift here, uh, you will find that eta i, j i, mu nu is zero, so angular momentum conservation. Okay. Wonderful. Good. So now let's get back, let's get back to these um, BMS charges. Um, we talked about these conservation laws for energy momentum and angular momentum. Now, what about super translations and super rotations, which are more generalized? Um, give rise to more generalized conservation laws at the classical level, do they also, are they also respected within the S matrix? Okay, so what we have to show, we want to show that Q plus equals Q minus holds also when wedged inside um, the S matrix element, which means essentially that we have to show that Q plus S minus S Q minus because Q minus is the one that's defined here, right? Q minus, and this is defined here, Q plus. So we have to show that um, the commutator of Q with the S matrix, so Q plus S minus S Q minus, that that vanishes. And the way to do this, or the way this was, uh, um, so this is what we want to, want to show. Um, the way to do it is, was by splitting these charges, the ones that are written over there, in a suitable way. So the Q plus minus will split into something that we call QS or something that we call QH. Where the S stands for soft, and the H stands for hard. And we will see that QS corresponds to the insertion of a soft graviton in the S matrix, and Q hard implements the BMS super translation on the hard particles. Okay. So now I have to give you some more details about charges, how we're going to split them in a soft and a hard piece. What does that mean? So let me write again the super translation charge. Am I writing big enough? Certainly not beautiful enough, but big enough, hopefully. So what we're now going to do is we're going to integrate by parts. We want to write this boundary term in U as an integral over all of null infinity. And we assume, so we'll have some integral over all of null infinity, Fujian null infinity, the U. Um, and so this integral over scribe plus minus will be an integral over all of the U, the U of whatever. Um, minus a term that's uh, at evaluated at scribe plus plus. And we will assume that the bonding mass aspect decays at scribe plus plus sufficiently fast so that we can drop this term. So we assume that it dies off in some way in the future, which is also something that we have to supplement our gravitational data with. And we briefly touched upon this uh, in the last lecture. Okay, so what do we get? We now have an integral over the null boundary, the u, d square x. And since the only thing that depends on u is the bounded mass aspect, we can pull the, the u derivative through. Oops. Now, if you remember, we had written down an equation for dum that was given to us by the constraint equation of Einstein's equations. 
So the UM was something, and what was that something? Well, let me write it down here. Um, so let me just write it down. So this was related to the A, the B, and B, which uh, remember that this is the U derivative of the data. And there was a minus 1 half that came with it, or minus 1 4, actually. And then there was also a piece that came with the UU component of the stress tensor. And this component of the stress tensor either contains a matter part or it contains uh, quadratic terms in C. Quadratic in CAB and NAB. Well, this piece here is linear in NAB. And because of this distinction that we have a piece that's linear in NAB and quadratic in NAB, um, if I had, let's say, two or three hours, I would go through the whole shebang of uh, sort of deriving, uh, deriving this uh, relation. But I don't have the time, so you have to believe me when I tell you that this piece here with linear and NAB um, is the soft piece, which is related to insertions of a soft graviton. Just very quickly, we talked about the fact that this comes from the unit derivative of CAB. It's traceless and symmetric. It has two polarizations. It's related to gravitons. It's relative to soft gravitons in that way. So when you um, write this charge, insert it in the S matrix, it will essentially uh, insert for you a soft graviton. So this is what this will do. And then this piece here is everything else. So this is the, called the hard charge. And anything that's sort of nonlinear in the news and the data, as well as the matter terms, are in the hard, uh, hard part. Okay. So there's actually many steps um, that go into showing that this conservation law holds inside the S matrix, which I don't have time to tell you. But essentially, um, what it boils down to is that if you start with a soft theorem, which I will now write in a slightly different form, if you multiply it by this pole, so you put the omega on the left-hand side, This is the soft theorem, where now the right hand side doesn't depend on omega. Everything is finite in omega as you take omega to zero. If you take this thing and you integrate over the sphere, let me do this schematically, and then you integrate it with this function f of x, then what you can show is that this precisely corresponds to the left hand side corresponding to the insertion of the soft charge in the S matrix, and the right-hand side, the soft factor, comes from the action of the hard charge on the hard particles in the in and out state. So the soft theorems, once you smear them over the sphere with this function uh, f of x, you will find it gives you the conservation equation that we set out to, to show. Now, this was for super translations, but you can run the, full, the whole game for super rotations. Where now you look at the soft, um, the super rotation charge, where you have the, instead of F, the vector field YA, instead of M, you have the angular momentum aspect. You do similar steps. Um, so, well, super super translations, super rotations. And what you can show then here is that the, um, 
S matrix, um, the, the soft theorem at the subleading order in one over the energy implies a similar uh, conservation law for the super rotation charge. Um, but in order to get to the subleading piece in the energy, what we have to do is we don't just have to multiply the S matrix by, by omega because that soft piece comes as omega to the zero, so that would go away. But instead, in order to get rid of the leading uh, soft theorem piece, we have to act with one plus omega d omega on the soft theorem, and then that picks out the subleading piece. Uh. So this gives the subleadings of factor. And you can show that this, once you integrate over the sphere and now with a vector field Ya, also gives uh, the conservation equation like this, but now with the super rotation charge. Good. So we'd love to go through that in detail, but it's very technical and it would take two hours. So we're not going to do it, but this is what um, the result is. Any questions? So what we have shown here is that by using the soft theorem, we can um, sort of uplift the classical conservation equation of VMS super translation super rotation charges to um, conservation equations that hold um, at the level of the S matrix. Yes. So what I'm saying here is that if you start with a soft theorem and you smear it over the sphere with these functions or vector field, then you can obtain the um, sort of the, the S matrix version, the quantum, yeah, the quantum field theory version of the classical conservation law that we had previously obtained by imposing the antipodal matching condition. What you can also show, I was not planning to do this, but what you can also show is that if you start with this equation here, you plug in what the charges are, so that will give you, you know, the F here um, and stuff. You can show that if you choose this F in a suitable way, you can go back to the soft theorem. And let me maybe just sketch this since you asked. So this piece here, the F of X, the A, db, nab, let me integrate by parts and pull the derivatives on f, okay? So if you pull the covariant derivatives on the f, what you will find is um, essentially, let's say we go instead of on the sphere, we go to the plane, so then it's easy, then this is just um, two antihomorphic derivatives, um, let me write it like this, dz bar, f of Z, Z bar. And if you choose this vector field now, and this is kind of similar to what we did yesterday with super rotations, uh, if you choose this to be Z bar, Z minus W, uh, yeah, Z minus W divided by Z bar minus W bar divided by Z minus W, you hit it with two Z bar derivatives, what you will get is a delta function. And then once you have the delta function inside this integral, you can use it to get rid of the sphere integral. And then what you find is, well, you also have to relate this NAB to the soft insertion, so this will correspond essentially to the soft graviton. But once you get rid of the sphere integral, what you can show is that you actually land precisely on the soft theorem. Similarly for uh, super rotations, I did not write down the super rotation charge in this soft hard split. But what the super rotation charge boils down to is um, instead of having these two derivatives hit the function f, what we would get is three derivatives hitting the vector field. And there's also a vector field that gives you a delta function. And which is that? Well, it's actually the one that we have been talking about yesterday. It's the one that is uh, z minus w squared divided by z bar minus w bar. So if you plug in this vector field, 
hit it by three derivatives, you get a delta function. And then once you plug in this delta function in the um, super rotation charge, what you will find is that you can reduce this whole sphere integral again, and you will land on the sublating self graviton theorem. So there's a two way street. One that starts with a the soft theorem and then smears it over the sphere with these arbitrary functions and uh, vector fields. And then you recover the conservation law um, for these BMS charges. Or you start with the conservation law for the BMS charges and um, plug in suitably some, some judiciously chosen symmetry parameters f and y. And then you recover the soft theorem. Other questions? Yes. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> yeah. Indeed. Thank you. Very good. OK. Now, let me also say a little bit briefly about gauge theory. If there are other questions, please just ask. OK, no questions. Uh -huh. So a similar story holds in gauge theory, um, both in abelian, non-abelian, also in supersymmetric theories. You can also ask about um, imposing some fall-off conditions on the gauge fields, um, choosing some suitable boundary condition, and then ask what are the residual gauge transformations. So let's just focus on electromagnetism, or then QED, once we talk about the S-matrix. Um, so suitable boundary condition in gauge theory would be you take the angular component AZ of the gauge field to be of order 1, the radial component to be of order, order R to the minus 2. Um, this is kind of natural because if you hit it with a U, you get a FUR. So this is the field strength which should go like 1 over R squared, so that's kind of natural. And then AU, we can pick it to be of order 1 over R. And then you ask, do there exist large gauge transformations that preserve those boundary conditions? And they do. So if you do some gauge transformation with respect to some, some, um, some function epsilon, you find that there exists suitable large gauge transformation preserving these boundary conditions if this epsilon is a function of the angles. You can then write down a large gauge charge. Which is very natural. So again, we evaluate this at the past of the future null boundary. Epsilon star f, which is essentially the 1 over r squared component of f u r multiplied by some arbitrary function. If you, if you had 1 here, then this would just be the global electric charge. But now you stick in some function of the angles, and suddenly you get infinitely many charges, both at the future and at the past uh, null boundary. And you also got the conservation law for those charges if you impose an antipodal matching condition for both the components of the field strength and for the symmetry parameter, epsilon. And let me maybe stress that if you have a constant here or a constant in F or the, Lorentz, um, the, the vector fields Y for Lorentz transformations, then you get the usual, usual conservation laws. But if you stick in these arbitrary functions, now what you get an infinity of conservation laws because for any function, these conservation laws have to be satisfied. So there's a conservation at every angle of charge, like charge, um, energy momentum, and angle momentum. And um, OK, so you can also show that. Um, Starting from the soft photon theorem, which you have seen before, where you have uh, a soft factor that um, instead of having 
two momenta, as in the soft graviton case, you now have some factor of the charge of the hard particles, which I call capital Q, pi mu, a polarization vector, epsilon mu, and then pi dot Q. And here, because I've written the hat, I've already pulled out the one over omega soft uh, pole. And um, as you've heard before, if you do this shift of the polarization vector, then you get charge conservation. But even more so, um, if you look at the large gauge charge, you get an infinity of um, charge conservation laws. And you can show that for a suitable chosen epsilon here, which would be 1 over z minus w, um, there is, if you run the same game as we have done here, there will be one, uh, one um, dz bar derivative that you can pull over to epsilon, and then it becomes a delta function. And then you collapse the sphere integral, and you can show that the conservation law for this large gauge charge reduces to the soft photon theorem. Or conversely, you can start with the soft photon theorem and integrate it over the sphere with some arbitrary function epsilon, and you get the ch this charge conservation law um, at the level of the S matrix. Uh huh. Perfect. All right. So now we're going to rewrite these nice soft theorems in an interesting way, which will lead up to the discussion of celestial holography, celestial conformal field theory, holography in asymptotical flat space. So what I'm going to do now is we're going to use again these coordinate sets at bar, these stereographic coordinates. And we're going to use, um, we're going to rewrite the momenta in um, a parameterization that uses these coordinates. So we have omega for the jth particle. And then the, I will parameterize the momenta in this way. So zj plus z bar j i times z bar j minus z j, and 1 minus z j z bar j. And the same thing for the null vector uh, of the soft graviton. And then we also have the polarization vector. Um, I think. Uh, Clifford did the same, so I'll write this as uh, two copies of the polarization vector. And I will parameterize my polarization vector of positive helicity by z bar 1 minus i minus z bar. So I'm being explicit here, so you can check, because it's nice to do an exercise and check what I'm saying is true. Uh, in the case of the soft photon, What the soft factor over here becomes in this parameterization is the following. So let me focus on positive felicity. And let me also drop um, the coupling, the E, and let me drop the etas. Let me reabsorb that in the charge Q. So what you get is QI over Z minus ZI. And now remember that you have on the left-hand side, you have the insertion of some soft uh, photon. On the right-hand side, you have the, the S-matrix element without that soft photon multiplied by this factor. And what does this look like? If you had a course on CFD, having this right-hand side looks awfully a lot like the insertion of a current in some correlation function. which is conserved, right? So this is the correlation function for the insertion of a conserved current J, which comes with this um, factor out front. So that's interesting. And this current here um, depends only on ZZ bar. So it's like a 2D. 2D current here. The soft graviton, let's see if this continues. Let's see if we find some conserved quantities, some conserved operators that are two-dimensional um, in terms of which we can rewrite the soft theorems. So for the leading soft graviton theorem, 
which unfortunately um, I'm using the same uh, variable for, but um, you know what I mean. So here, what the soft factor that was somewhere, it had the PP um, over P dot Q dotted into an epsilon tensor, uh, dotted into a polarization tensor. What that becomes is omega i z bar minus z bar i over z minus z i. Um, there was an extra factor of the energy because um, from, the, from the soft theorem of the photon, you have Q times P, and in the case of gravity, you have P times P. So there's an extra factor of, of omega, which is here. And this doesn't really look like anything. But if you take a Z bar derivative, then this looks like there is another uh, correlation function of some other current. And I'm dropping the kappas and the ittas, which takes this form. So we have this here and this here. So we seem to be, conser we seem to be getting conservation equation for, for some two-dimensional currents. Um, this would be a U1 current. Go ahead and call it soft photon current. This you may call super translation current. And we will see that it does uh, weird things. And then finally, let's talk about the subleading soft graviton, where the soft factor S hat 1. Um, now let me take a negative polarization for the soft graviton. So this becomes something that doesn't look like anything at all. So this becomes this differential operator where we have um, um, a diff um, derivative with respect to the Z zi coordinates that will act on the hard particles in the, in the amplitude. This doesn't look like anything, right? I mean, what is this? Turns out if you smear this, this function here on the sphere, d square z prime, with um, a particular kernel, 1 over z minus z prime to the fourth, then this becomes actually something nice. It becomes sum over i. Oh, and I should say that the hi here is shorthand for, it's actually an operator, it's shorthand for uh, 1 half minus omega i d omega i plus li. So we've looked at scalars where this term is not there, but if you had hard particles with spin, you would have this li here. So this is also an operator. So what you get when integrating over the sphere with this particular kernel here is you get minus omega i d omega i plus l i, so what I've written there, over 2 z minus uh, z i squared plus d by d z i over z minus z i acting on the hard amplitude. Does anybody recognize what this is? Louder? It's the correlation function over stress energy tension, TZZ. But it's a bit non standard because in a correlation function in a CFT, um, we would have on the right hand side the number here. We would have the conformal weights, HI, of the operators um, that are given by uh, momenta I, PI. So this doesn't quite look like the correlation function of a stress tensor. And the reason is we are in this energy basis. And in this energy basis, this is an operator. So what we're going to do uh, in the next lecture is we're going to find the basis that turns this operator, h hat i, into a number. And once we do that, we will see that soft theorems in disguise are correlation functions of conserved quantities on the celestial sphere at null infinity. 
So we have a celestial sphere here. And these operators, the J, the P, the T, they will live on the celestial sphere. And this is sort of suggestive of potentially a conformal field theory living on the celestial sphere, where we have these uh, conserved operators, and in particular the stress tensor, which, um, coming back to the previous lecture, uh, relates to um, the enhancement of uh, Lorentz transformations, which on the celestial sphere act as global conformal transformations. So this is an enhancement of the global ones to local conformal transformations. And this is what we would like in CFD. So this is uh, another motivation from the lecture of yesterday for why we should relax the boundary conditions that BMS gave us a little bit to allow at least for isolated uh, singularities. It's because it gives us, uh, it gives meaning to this correlation function of the stress tensor and it enhances um, global to local conformal symmetry. I think I'm over time. This piece? Yeah, suppose I replace that operator with the stress tensor. Ah, that operator? Yeah, 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 yeah okay, so um, you can. You can consider correlation functions of several t's in principle, right? So what would be the uh, central charge? <laughs> okay, <laughs> you're jumping way ahead. So, okay, okay, good. I will discuss uh, the OP expansion tomorrow. I didn't know if I have time, but since you asked, we'll probably get to it. Um, let me postpone this to tomorrow. Yeah. yeah, let me postpone this. There has to be some mystery left so that you come uh, to the lecture in, in an engaged way. So, yeah, Ivo. Is there a way to understand the, why you need the hard line? Why you need what? The hard line. Uh, a better understanding of why you need to the isolated yeah, points. Cosmic strings, yeah. Yeah, so Stromer and Chibuerov have given an interpretation in terms of cosmic strings. Um, so if you act with super translations or super rotations, that corresponds to adding soft gravitons. So that action by the triangle that I've written somewhere, so the insertion of soft gravitons in the S matrix do correspond to precisely the action of these uh, transformations, but both in the super translation and super rotation case. So no difference from that perspective um, with regards to, so I mean, it's also present there already for super translations where we do not have the boundary conditions violated, yeah. Uh, yeah. It, it suggests if you want this, or if you want to want a little bit more, if you also want to allow for non-meromorphic uh, guys, then it suggests that we should give up the boundary condition that uh, that BMS imposed. We should let we should allow the, the sphere to fluctuate. Um, so this is what this is suggesting. And if you like, if you like CFT, then you kind of should go with that. But there are still, still open questions about uh, the gravitational phase space and, and what happens here. So there are still some unanswered questions that are at a basic level. Yeah. All right, if there are no more questions, let's thank Andrea again. See you all tomorrow at 9 a.m.